You know, I'm a big fan of Taika Waititi. He has written and directed movies that are objectively pretty damn good. Like for example, Hunt for the Wilder People, Jojo Rabbit and of course Thor Ragnarok. But maybe success has gotten a little bit to his head because I can't really think another reason of why the writing in his previous films had a certain quality and in Thor Love and Thunder is just bad. I mean really really bad. Not only it is clunky and messy, but it feels a bit that some of the scenes were written using improv amongst the actors. Not exactly something that you should be proud of as a writer if other people are writing your script. Now before I go on, I must say there will be spoilers. The film styles itself as an action comedy, but in both of these areas is really lacking. The action feels stale and almost boring, you might say, and the comedy is a hit and miss at best. And most of the times, it definitely feels like the latter. I mean, the comedy is so bad that almost for the entirety of the film, it felt more like I was watching a kid's movie and not something that's mostly geared towards adults. Which, you know, is something you would expect from a movie that starts with a somber and grim scene where a father watches his daughter starve to death. And then, right before he dies, somehow, in a sort of magical and extremely convenient way, he finds himself in front of the same god that he expected to save him. And of course, this desperate, starved, half-mad wretch of a man asks for his god's help. But the god belittles and torments him, and only with the help of the necro sword, a sort of magical weapon that can kill gods, that desperate man is able to murder his god, and now his mission in life is to kill all the gods, as a way of taking revenge for the death of his daughter and the mass starvation of his peoples. Now, does all that sound like something that belongs in a comedy film, especially one that is written for kids? The things that don't make sense don't just stop here. This is just the beginning. It only gets worse as the film progresses. We see a terrific acting performance from Dark Knight's ex-Batman, aka Christian Bale. His character Gore dances effortlessly in and out of scenes like a child's nightmare, but his all too serious and murderous character doesn't seem to really belong in this movie. Because if you remove his eerie presence that comes not from his character per se, but more of the acting performance, then what remains is a cartoonish villain that brings dark monsters from beneath the shadows and steals children in the dead of night. And from all of that, we understand that he's basically some kind of space grinch, and that's what I'm gonna call him from now on. So the space grinch wants to kill all the gods, and that's basically his motivation in the movie. But what about Thor, you might ask? Where is he? How is he doing? The last time we saw him was at the end of Endgame, as someone who is fat and bored and in a little bit of an emotional mess. And he was going for an adventure with his new buddies, the Guardians of the Galaxy. But if you don't remember all of that, no worries there. In an extremely long and tedious montage sequence, Korg tells us all there is to know about what happened between Endgame and now. Thor is not fat anymore because he has done some training and that's basically it for his character. He doesn't seem to have the same hunger for war and fighting and he only joins the Guardians of the Galaxy in their fight when they explicitly ask him to. Now, this was the scene that I knew this film is gonna be bad. From all the previews that have been released, I had only seen the teaser and the CGI didn't look all that great. But I figured, hey, it's quite early, they have time, maybe they'll fix it. Did they fix it? No. No, they didn't. Thor battles some... I don't know what the hell these things are, like space owls or something. And everything, the action, the comedy, the fight choreography, it just feels absolutely ridiculous. From this very first action sequence, it looks like you're not watching a movie with actual stakes in it, but some kind of Sunday TV show with puppets and some poor college students wearing fairy costumes that only took this job to pay the rent. The comedy is way off. You could even say it is non-existent. The action is a saturated, over-the-top extravaganza that probably belongs in those so bad, so good movies that Nicolas Cage is making. But honestly, I think the only reason this uh, sequence was in the movie was just because they needed an action set piece so the audience won't fall asleep in their seats. Now, a big part of the movie is about Jane Foster, the Natalie Portman ex-girlfriend character, who I personally thought we'll never see again in these movies because, you know, she really didn't want to be in them and that's why her character was written out of the story. But here she is, she's back and she has cancer. 
what a fun story for kids. And all this time, from the basic gist that I had gathered about the plot, I thought that a big chunk of the film would be about Jane Foster becoming Mighty Thor. And maybe her character arc would be about how difficult it is for a simple human woman to control and master her new godlike and devastating powers. And maybe half the movie would be spent on Thor mentoring and teaching her. And gradually their relationship would mend and develop. And maybe it would take some kind of new direction. For all of that, my reasoning was very simple. Jane Foster in the film is dying. She needs help. She needs someone to show her the ropes. And that's how I thought the movie would go. But of course, none of that happens. Why bother with character arcs when you have contrivances and easy and effortless plot MacGuffins to help you out of story problems? Jane Foster doesn't need anybody for anything. Not Thor, not doctors or other scientists. She just figures it out all by herself. No trouble at all. She thinks that if she can just unlock the secrets of Thor's hammer, the one that has been destroyed in Ragnarok, then she can just defeat the cancer and get back in her feet in no time. But we already know that it takes basically a godlike power to just yield the hammer. So how on earth will she even manage to pull it off the ground and study it? That kind of seems like a pretty insurmountable story problem right there. I wonder how the movie would get through this in a logical and straightforward way. Well, it doesn't really. The hammer just comes to her, I guess, and that's about it. In another excruciating long montage sequence, where we see Thor and Jane Foster having their past cutie love affair, which in all honesty, it looks like an extended hemorrhage commercial, we'll <laughs> We learn that somehow Thor's hammer has like a conscience or at least a mind of its own. And Thor made a promise to the hammer to watch over her. So the hammer just reassembles itself when it senses Jane Foster is nearby. And for her throughout the film, all this godlike power that she now has doesn't really change her as a person. I mean, as something you would expect to happen when someone now has the power of a god. No, Jane Foster just stays the same. Up to this point of the movie, you kind of understand the writing is beyond bad. It's indifferent. It's indifferent to the story and to the characters, and it doesn't really have any kind of respect for the audience. And all of that are known in the screenwriting business as, yeah, 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 whatever. We need Jane Foster to become Mighty Thor as fast as possible, because the Guardians of the Galaxy are not in this movie, so Thor needs to have someone around to talk to. And we desperately need to have Jane Foster kick ass as Mighty Thor as fast as possible because without the action set pieces, the film is as interesting as a lifetime movie. When Thor hears the news that the space cringe is killing gods right and left, he travels back to Earth using the Bifrost. But Heimdall is dead, you might say. How does he do that? Who exactly is at the head of the Bifrost? Yeah, the movie doesn't care to explain in swiftly, Thor finds himself back on Earth at the exact time when the Space Greens attacks the Asgardian settlement. After a brief and mostly stale action sequence, the Space Greens kidnaps the Asgardian children and Thor and Jane Foster has to spend the rest of the movie trying to save them. And that takes them to this mythical realm where many of the gods sit. They want to recruit some of the gods as some kind of A-team that will help them defeat the Space Greens. All in all, for me, this sequence was really funny. I don't know, maybe because I'm Greek and I found Russell Crowe's Greek accent and portrayal of Zeus absolutely hilarious. Well, yes, you see the area that looks very much like a stage. I mean, he sounds and acts like a Greek farmer, first of the boat, working in an Australian kebab shop or something. (laughs) But still, jokes aside, what the hell is wrong with Zeus's thunder? It looks like a child's toy. How can you make a big budget action movie and end up with a prop that looks like it came from some 70s short and sandal movie? And furthermore, if you're gonna have Russell Crowe in the movie, don't just end his scene there. Take him along for the ride. There's no one else in the film besides Thor that has the comedy chops to make scenes funny and interesting, and Russell Crowe does an excellent job here. Now I want to focus on why the plot is so threadbare and why there are really no stakes in this movie. I think it's because many of the things that the characters want to achieve happen for them way too easily. Jane Foster becomes Mighty Thor, basically off-screen, like it's something that is effortless, but it just feels sloppy 
and cheap. And I think the only reason the film did this was because they just wanted that trailer moment where she grabs Thor's hammer out of the air. You know, in storytelling and in screenwriting, sacrificing a character's development just for one shot is considered a very, very bad idea. And I think this idea of throwing away the potential of something good just for one scene comes again when we meet Zeus. The film has a tremendous opportunity here to introduce us to new characters and grow the lore of the story. But almost immediately, the whole purpose of the sequence becomes, let's just steal Zeus Thunder and get the hell away. But there is no real obstacles in our character's way. One minute the film tells us that Zeus is the most powerful of the gods, and the next Thor just strikes him down and steals his thunder. And that's it. Everything is too easy for our characters. They have no problem to solve, no opportunity to use their smarts or show us another side to their characters. Everything is done without any effort. But that's the price you pay for a bad movie. If characters are being given everything without any effort, we tend to lose respect for them. Up to this point, if any of you had any kind of doubt that you were watching a kid's movie, then wait no further. Because at the end of the film, when Thor finds the Asgardian kids, he gives them his power for a limited time. And we have another ridiculous scene where the kids are fighting the dark, sadway monsters. And all of this is supposed to be funny and enjoyable, but the tone shift is completely jarring and it looks awkward and weird. And the whole thing in the end where there is this magical being that can grant any wish but can only be accessed by Stormbreaker kind of makes a mess of the previous storylines. I mean, if it can grant any wish, why didn't Thor, after the end of Infinity War, just went to the magic being and just ask them to basically undo the blip and everything Thanos did? All in all, this was a disappointing film, to say the least. It relies mostly at Chris Hemsworth's charm and charisma and to the acting chops of Christian Bale. All the rest is just a big mess. The dramatic scenes don't really have any breathing room. The film tries to cram in a joke as fast as possible, which just ruins the tone of the scene. If we were to compare Love and Thunder with a much more successful action comedy like Thor Ragnarok, I guess you could say the real difference between the two is effort, charisma, and talent. Taika Waititi didn't really make any effort in writing a great script. But the script isn't the only problem. The directing is kind of bland, production design and costumes are a bit over the top, and the cinematography, I think, was mostly decided in the CGI room, because visually the film is a vomit-inducing color extravaganza. But what I think is the film's greatest problem is the lack of talent and charisma. Ragnarok had a plethora of characters with great comedy chops, like Loki or Hulk or even Jeff Goldblum's character. If you have all these actors on set, you can make a scene special just by their talent and their charisma alone. And if you have a good script, then you have an opportunity for something really special. But who exactly has the comedy chops in Love and Thunder? Not Natalie Portman with her giant CGI arms? You think I didn't notice? Come on. Or how about Tessa Thompson? For the entirety of the film, she just looks bored and uninteresting in whatever happens. And so all the comedy falls on Thor and Korg, and obviously, as we see in the movie, that just wasn't enough. Finally, I think this film works mostly as a cautionary tale. It's what happens when a writer-director has too much confidence in their craft, without actually putting any effort to make a great movie. And that shows. It really shows. So, that's it with this review. If you like the video, like, share and leave a comment. For more videos, please consider subscribing and pressing the bell button.